Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White. Welcome to the Myth Salon. I'm extremely honored today to have Dr. Rebecca Armstrong, especially talking with us about American exceptionalism and hyper-individuality, which seems very, very appropriate given all of the recent activity in the past couple of months. Today, as many of you know, I've been working on a project about the Tao Te Ching. And Lawrence Brown has written an article for what is going to be a book coming out about that on synchronicity. And I thought I'd do a schwangza. That's, that's a bad, can't even get it up there. There we go. And in that though, I found this collection of quotes. This one's from Elie Wiesel. I built my entire work on questions, not answers. It's important not to accept easy answers. Easy answers are always the wrong answers. Questions remain, answers change. Sometimes the answer changes. Sometimes it changes more than once in a generation. And why are we here is the most important question a human being has to efface. Our obligation is to give meaning to life and in doing so to overcome the passive indifferent life. A person who is indifferent is dead without knowing it. I believe that life has meaning in spite of the meaningless deaths I have seen. Death has no meaning, life does. We must make every minute rich and enriching, not for oneself, but for someone else, and thereby create a bridge between beings that limits the do domain of nothingness. Life is a gift and meaning is its reward. The meaning of life is to be found in every encounter. Every moment is a moment of grace. And this surprising was from Armin Herrer, who, with whom I had the privilege of working very closely in the early 80s. The first thing I look at each morning is a picture of Albert Einstein I keep on the table right next to my bed. The personal inscription reads, a person first starts to live when he can live outside of himself. In other words, when he can have as much regard for his fellow human being as he does for himself. I believe we are here to do good. It is the responsibility of every human being to aspire to do something worthwhile, to make this world a better place than the one he had just found. Life is a gift. And if we agree to accept it, we must contribute in return. When we fail to contribute, we fail to ad adequately answer why we were here. So, and this was from 1989. Can't believe I kept it all these years. I'm really touched by how our collective has been pushed to the back by our prioritizing and privileging the sense of individuality. Individuality comes at a huge price. So as we're listening to Rebecca and my fellow panelists today, I hope we'll think about, is the price of individuality worth it? What are we learning from being individuals? What if we had started off our country honoring diversity the traditions of the indigenous people, women, people of color? What if we had not gone down the path of privileging individuality? It's worth thinking about. So on that note, let's open up with a moment of silence, please.
Okay, my good friend, Will, why don't you take it away? Let's see what we're in for today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dana. Thanks for the uh, wonderful poem. Um, individuality, I, I, uh, about a week into COVID, I got a knock on my door and I opened my door and there are two police officers. They say, we wanna come in and search your place. I'm thinking to myself, everybody's taught you, we don't, this is before the conspiracy theorists even took control of the narrative and everybody's just thinking to themselves, you know, this is a moment where our personal privacies, our individual rights for privacy are going to come up. And how are we gonna to respond to that as a culture? And so here I am, these two police officers wanna search my place and they say to me that there is a missing woman in the neighborhood and they're searching places for this missing woman. Now I've got this choice to be combative over the defense of my rights in this moment that rights are feeling kind of compromised or challenged or a little bit tested or do I sacrifice my individuality and say come in and search for this person um, and I, I realized in that moment that I'm confronting the exact choice that so many of us had to confront around COVID around giving up the prioritization of our own individuality to take care of the rest of a world that we care for and when we started talking with Rebecca about this event, uh, my first reaction was actually like individual individualism, like this is such a hot topic, like it's touchy. And I was a little hesitant at first because this is like the conversation around individuality and the American myth has everything to do with all of our domestic challenges and all of our international challenges right now. It's a really big issue. It touches a lot of things. It's deeply rooted in not just a Western psyche, but an embodiment, you know, in the individual form that we are. So it's a very tricky topic. And, you know, I think that um, we decided to do it because we really think that Rebecca is a great person to usher us into this conversation. And so first, I just want to thank Rebecca for being here and to prime this conversation by saying, um, we fully recognize how charged and significant this conversation is. So with that, I'd like to welcome one of our special guests tonight, uh, Dr. Epek Burnett, uh, who is the author of A Jungian Inquiry into the American Psyche, The Violence of Innocence uh, by Rutledge. Uh, and she's a contributing writer at Counterpunch, where she provides a depth, depth psychological critique of social, cultural, and political issues. Born and raised in Istanbul, Turkey, Burnett came to the United States to get a bachelor's degree from Brown University in Modern Culture and Media and in International Relations. After receiving her first master's degree in Expressive Arts Therapy from California Institute of Integral Studies, she got a second master's and a doctorate degree in Depth Psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute. Based in San Francisco, she serves as the chair of the board at Voice of Witness, a human rights and oral history education nonprofit, where she's on the executive committee of Human Rights Watch San Francisco chapter. Dr. Burnett is also a published novelist, essayist, and poet in Turkey. Uh, so thank you, uh, first of all, for joining us and contributing to this conversation around the American psyche myth uh, and unconscious. Uh, and moving to our more familiar panel, uh, I want to share my screen and introduce you to everybody to make sure everyone knows where you can find this on our website. So if you come here, this is where you land on the home page. You can go to programs select Myth Salon, and this will load up over here. And you can see any of our Myth Salons by clicking right here. There'll be a playlist of all of them. So first, of course, you know Dr. Dana White, author, scholar, host of this Myth Salon, contributing faculty at Pacifica Graduate Institute. He's recently finished his Dow project, and I hope you've all checked it out. My name is Will Lin. There's a picture of me singing to my grandfather. Uh, I'm, a, I'm the founder of Myth House and the general education department at Hushman College, where I teach myth to filmmakers and performing artists. We're also joined by Dr. Dennis Patrick Slattery, a mythology scholar, poet, longtime professor in Pacifica's doctoral program in mythology and a prolific author. To check out his books and tours and events, uh, go to DennisPatrickSlattery.com. Selena Matthews joins us as a clinical psychologist, author, keynote speaker, Pacifica graduate, and CEO of Soul Transformation Seminars. Zaman Stanizai is a professor of mythology and political science at Pacifica and Cal State, a poet, linguist, mystic, and Fulbright scholar. He's written extensively on a wide range of topics from Indo-Iranian languages to identity politics, political philosophy, Sufi poetry, and esoteric Islamic thought. Dr. Boris Nunley is a professor of philosophy, literature, and rhetoric 
who lectures across the country on the intersection of literature, spirituality, myth, and contemporary life with an interest in the dark feminine race and transformation. We're also thrilled to have with us tonight, Clive Ford, uh, who gave a talk with us recently, and we thought he would just be a wonderful person to invite to this conversation. Clyde's an author and mythologist whose work includes Precious Cargo, Whiskey Golf, Think Black, a memoir, and The Hero with an African Face. He's been featured as a guest on Oprah, NPR, C-SPAN, Book TV, and of course, Myth House. Thanks for joining us today, Clyde. And this brings us to Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca is a graduate of the University of Chicago Divinity School uh, and has been a practicing, is, and has been practicing as an interfaith minister for over 20 years. During which, during which time uh, she's given talks on myth and philosophy around the world. Rebecca was instrumental to the formation of the Joseph Campbell Foundation Mythological Roundtable Network. And I've got to pause and say, this is actually the first time I, I came across Rebecca. I uh, was the newsletter editor for the Mythological Roundtable Network after running a roundtable for many years. And there was a project where we uh, went through our guidebook on how to start a roundtable with Martin Wires and some of our other friends. And uh, this guidebook had all kinds of stuff in it, including history on the round table. And this is when I first read your name, Rebecca. And so it's such an honor to be with you. Uh, and then, of course, I saw you in Pat Solomon's film, Finding Joe. Uh, so Rebecca also teaches myth, religion, and ethics at DePaul and Indiana University. And in 1999, I just think this is the most incredible thing. Uh, she had the privilege to open for Nelson Mandela's acceptance speech of a World Peace Award during the 1999 Parliament of the world religions. So thank you for joining us, Rebecca. And thank you for your bravery and leaving. Oh, my gosh. And I slipped. Did I miss Selena Matthews? Um, no, I don't think I did. Uh, thanks for double checking. I would hate to do that. Um, thank you for joining us, Rebecca. And I hope that you will uh, uh, trust that we promise to be kind and appreciative of your bravery and leading us through this very tense topic. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Will. I love everybody who's brave enough to start a mythological round table and carry that through. So um, this is such a wonderful topic. And I will confess at the outset that the minute we finished our first conversation about this, my mind started shooting out in a hundred different directions. And I did <clears throat> what I always do, which is to allow the images to lead me. So I've actually gone in a lot of directions that I wasn't even aware were going to be there. And you'll hear about individualism, but you'll hear a lot of other threads that suddenly poke their heads up as I began to explore this. Because my working title ha has been waking up in the American dream. And I took this idea really from one of the most oft quoted remarks that Carl Jung made when he said, I, I realized I did not know the myth I was living and realized that was the most important work for me to do. This idea that we can wake up to the myth we are living has become so commonplace in our day and age. And yet we mistake the intent and import of the question. We're looking for what myth or archetype can I identify with? But in fact, what Jung was saying was, if you don't know the myth you are living, the myth, will live you. You will not have an individuality because the archetypal energies will flow through that form, that archetypal form, and you as an individuated person will not exist. You will simply be a vehicle for the archetypal energies. And to me, this is the critical piece that we need to recognize, that there is an archetypal myth, a mythic identity that is American. And that if we're not aware of it, we will find ourselves moving into and accepting the script of this archetypal mythic identity, which is characterized as the American, and will fail to do the necessary work to really wake ourselves up in the dream and begin to forge with great effort a true individuality. 
hyper individualism is, I think, one of the shadow sides of the mythic identity of an American. This was first noticed by Alexis de Tocqueville when he came through America and was so brilliant in drawing his inferences from his observations that Americans are so obsessed with being equal to everybody else that they have ignored the deep inner work of striving for excellence in their own selfhood. So I think we have this situation uh, that, you know, that Aristotle talks about, that the ideal is actually the moderate point in the middle. So you have the possibility of simply falling off in the, the deep end of being one of that, you know, morass of the man of the masses who live lives of quiet desperation, or you pick up this hyper individualism that is the American archetype of that free and mighty individual, the cowboy, the lone ranger type. But both of those are in error. Both of those are mistaking uh, finding the true identity for actually being lived through, for becoming a vessel for an archetypal energy. So what I have done is sort of a digital version of what I used to watch Joseph Campbell do when he was our house guest over the many years in the 70s and 80s that he came to visit us. Because the first thing he would do was bring in his trays, those round carousels of slides that you dropped in. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember those. You used to have to project one image at a time onto a screen using these cumbersome and very heavy pieces of mechanical gadgetry. And if you wanted to rearrange your images, you had to literally pick the slides out of the tray and put them in a different order. And Joe would spend days working on his slide trays. And this is how I was introduced to how do you put together a talk around a mythic topic. So I have done the digital version, which is my beloved PowerPoint, where I've assembled the images that tell the story that guided me through this inquiry into what is the American myth, the archetype, especially the character that we see as being at the center of the American story. So what I'd like to do now is share my screen and go through the slides. I have a couple of stories that I'll be telling during this PowerPoint. And because the centerpiece of the psychological import of this work comes near the center of the PowerPoint and has to do with how innocence becomes violence, I'll spend a little more time with that. And then at the conclusion, we'll go directly to Epec because her work, um, her dissertation and her book are so closely connected to that problem, that particular psychological problem. So with that, um, I will share my screen with you. Waking up in the American dream. I begin with the idea that we are going to do a thought experiment. I'm not gonna to try to insist or prove a point. I'm merely going to ask that you consider the possibility that what I am suggesting might be true. And this thought experiment is the idea that the nation, a country, is a human thing and does what we do for our reasons. This is actually a quote from a movie that came out while I was in high school called A Lion in Winter, screenplay by James Goldman. And even at that time, at that young age, I was deeply moved by this idea that the nation is a human thing. At the time, I didn't realize that this is a longstanding theme in uh, cosmology, the notion that every individual, every nation state, every uh, experiment has a guiding daimon. It has a character. 
here we have a, an early 10th century uh, image from an illuminated manuscript of the countries of Germania and Gallia and Roma bringing offerings to the emperor versus a, a 1909 cartoon in Puck magazine that shows the US, Germany, Britain, France, and Japan as characterized by their personas, their national personas. Here's the famous image of Delacroix with Socrates being whispered to by his own personal daimon. The idea that all of history, every nation, um, every possibility is working in an evolutionary manner towards some end. It's a teleological imagination that things are not just happening randomly and chaotically, like a seed moving towards an end point. There is a purpose and a direction and unfolding an evolutionary energy to it. This is a, an image of Teilhard de Jardin's Omega Point teleology. And here's a very humorous one of America as a maturing individual going from its infancy, boyhood, through to its fat eldering in 1899, as it begins its own empire and tyrannical uh, absorbing of other nationalities around the world. This idea of a teleological imagination is also very well known in mythology. Joseph Campbell himself put forth the idea that there were four major evolutionary stages in mythology. And that if you look at different cultures, you can see how they've moved through these four mythological eras or stages. The first two are found in his first two volumes of the Atlas of World Mythology, The Way of the Animal Powers and The Way of the Seeded Earth. He had also the notes for the second half of his atlas. The third volume was to be The Way of the Celestial Lights, and the last volume was The Way of the Human, which is the era in which we are now living. But all sorts of other um, thinkers have given this idea of the teleology of history. Um, Jean Gebser, from whom Ken Wilber drew his notion that the integral domain is the final stage in evolution. The mythologist William Irwin Thompson puts forward a teleological idea of myth. Marshall McLuhan believed that there was a teleology of communication. So these are, are all examples of how this imagination moves us into the realm of history and of myth. So that's how I'm setting this talk up, that there, this is a thought experiment. And the foundational thought is that we are living in a teleological myth that has a beginning, a middle, and a destination, whether or not we are moving towards that ultimate end is going to be the question. So I've mentioned already the idea that there is an American archetype, there is an American character, which we can see and trace from the very beginnings, the very origins of our country. In fact, even before America becomes a country, we can see in the political cartoons of the pre-revolutionary and post-revolutionary decades, the characterizations of America. So here America is a horse throwing off its rider, King George. The wildness, the freedom that is America starts right at the beginning of our imagining, our self-imaginings of who we are. Here is America giving a bloody nose to John Bull, England, Britain, in the form of King George. We also have a lot of images of America in her feminine disguise. So in the image to the left, that's Britannia with her high hairdo fighting America, who here is a female Native American 
with her headdress, again, bloodying the nose of the queen. The second image, the black and white image on the screen is an important one because America for a long time in this pre-revolutionary phase sees itself as being victimized by King George, by Britain. Here, America is being physically held down and forced to drink her bitter draft. And here is the beleaguered mother, Britannia, who is here I so identified with her children, her colonies, that as the states, as the colonies try to break off, she is seen as a dismembered matriarch. This idea of America being the daughter to her mother, the British Empire, is seen again in this later image where America is now maturing to become an empress in her own right. So these images, again, the, the images of cartoons, political cartoons have always fascinated me. The political cartoonist, it seems to me, plays the role of the court jester, the holy fool, the sacred clown, and this role of being the truth teller against the status quo is so important that if we're trying to figure out what's really happening, what are we not hearing? What are the hidden truths living in the margins? We could do no better than to look at political cartoons because they are really giving us the underbelly of the party line. Now, one thing I'm gonna draw your attention to now, which we saw very briefly in one of the previous images of America as a horse, is this centering motif of heroes with axes. That's A-X-E, the ax. There's a whole uh, realm of mythological studies that looks at gods and goddesses, heroes and heroines, and identifies them through the objects that they hold in their hands, right? The tools, the weapons, um, the mudras, the hand gestures, these are all very important symbolic aspects of the personas of heroes, gods, and goddesses. And my theory is that this, the hero with the ax, is actually the centering image. And if you look carefully, you're going to find this image embedded in multiple stories, in multiple time periods, throughout the history of our country. And I want to draw this out and try to explain why it's so important. Heroes with axes. I give you as example number one, George Washington. We're gonna come back to his story of the cherry tree because I think it's a critical formational story in the American mind. But who was our second greatest president but Abraham Lincoln? And here's the iconic painting of Abraham Lincoln as the rail splitter. Honest Abe with his ax. Honest George with his ax. But we also have Davy Crockett with his ax. The great outdoor hunter, the man of the wilds. And finally, of course, is the great folk hero, Paul Bunyan with his ax. Now, why is the hero with the ax important? The hero with the ax is one of the very earliest archetypes that we have. This is a rock art painting, rock art painting that comes from the Bronze Age. So we're going back five, six, 7,000 years. The hero with the ax is what Joseph Campbell referred to as the most primal hero. He says, quote, the elementary deeds of the hero are those of the clearing of the field. And if you think about it, the whole Bronze Age in the uh, Mediterranean field in North America, it's about clearing land. It's about making space for human habitation. And so the brawn, 
of the hero who is able to go into the wilderness with the ax to clear it and to remove the dangerous wild animals and monsters is the ultimate heroic act. The hero with the ax is the foundational mythic structure of the Americas. And so here we have this very important symbol that's going to reoccur multiple times. But let's start with the cleaned up version of it, of little George and the cherry tree. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but it might help just to be reminded of the actual text, which is in um, you know, our mythic imagination. We all remember hearing this story as school children. It's still in the textbooks. And yet, of course, there is a great deal of debate as to whether there is any authenticity in the story. It was first published by Reverend Weems in 1800, and he insists that he heard the story from the lips of a cousin of George Washington who often visited the family estate. As you know, the story takes place in the family orchard. Little George has a hatchet for his birthday. He creeps out and cuts down the cherry tree with his little hatchet. His father comes out and, full of indignation, demands to know why, who has cut down the cherry tree. And George, who now comes out to face his father, says, and I'll, I'll quote now from Reverend Weems, I can't tell a lie, Pa. You know I won't tell a lie. I did it with my hatchet. And now this is very significant. What does the father do? The father says, Run to my arms, you dearest boy. Run to my arms, for glad am I, George, that you killed my tree. For you have paid me for it a thousandfold. Such an act of heroism in my son is worth more than a thousand trees, though blossomed with silver and their fruits of purest gold. The honesty of confessing is worth everything. And I think it's so important to notice that there is absolutely no consequence for having chopped down the cherry tree. The tension over the guilt and anxiety of having done something wrong is instantly erased through confession, through bearing one's soul, confessing one's misdeeds, and being embraced back into the arms of the father. The fact that this story continues to claim our attention is very obvious, again, looking at political cartoons down through the ages. Uh, here's Woodrow Wilson as George and the cherry tree. Uh, here's Nixon and the cherry tree, Reagan and the cherry tree, Rumsfeld and the cherry tree, uh, Clinton, Obama, Hillary, and of course, Trump. I'm sure there are many more, but I got so many that I, I realized I couldn't continue. The idea that honesty is going to be the important catalyst for returning into the good graces of American society is really hardwired into the psyche from this foundational myth. Um, as a recap, let me just sort of reinforce this idea of why that story about George Washington is so important. Some of you probably know the works of Bruno Bettelheim, the child psychologist who taught at the University of Chicago for quite a long time. His book, The Uses of Enchantment, starts with a chapter about this experiment that he used to do in his college classrooms at the beginning of every semester. He would ask all of his students to write down in class which fairy tale they remembered from childhood, the very first one they remembered, and to write down the outline of that fairy tale to the best of their memory. And then he'd collect all of these uh, papers and save them. And the homework was to go and find an actual copy of the original Grimm's uh, and see if your memory had served you well, if in fact, you were remembering the fairy tale. And how had that storyline, that character and plot line 
affected your life into young adulthood. And then in the book, Uses of Enchantment, you will find all sorts of interesting stories from his students about how that earliest fairy tale had actually directed and focused their own path, their own sense of self. And sometimes it was a single image from a fairy tale that was so powerful that it had in fact come true. They had uh, made it emerge in their life just by the focus on what that fairy tale image was. So this is my idea that that foundational fairy tale of George and the Cherry Tree is playing the same role that as a nation and as a national character, we are axe wielding heroes, but obsessed and concerned with bloodying the parent or the parent's tree and eager to get back into the good graces of the parent through confessing our sin and finding atonement. Now this story or plot line may begin to sound familiar to any of you who are still religious or had religious childhoods. We'll come to that in a moment. But here's another part of the uh, thought experiment that's very important. It's this wonderful word that Jung introduced to psychology in the West, an antiodromia. He credits it to Heraclitus, and I think that's correct. He said, Heraclitus discovered the most marvelous of all psychological laws, the function of the opposites. He called it an antiodromia, the running contrary wise, by which he meant that sooner or later, everything turns in to its opposite. So this is such a powerful and important move, especially if you're talking about shadow, because Freud's idea of the return of the repressed is based in this foundational or functional law of the psyche, that whatever is pushed to its extreme, whether that's in the bright light or the darkest shadow, is eventually going to turn into its opposite. Here, we have, and again, this is a, an example. You may not recognize this painting, but it shows up in one of the great movies of the last generation called The Picture of Dorian Gray, which is a beautiful illustration of this principle of Anantiodromia and the return of the repressed, the shadow image. This is the handsome Mr. Dorian Gray, a portrait of him. And as the story unfolds, he loses none of his charm. He is the most amiable and well-liked fellow, but he leads the most heinous life. He is an absolute cad. He's horrifically brutal and exploitative. And yet he continues to have this beautiful demeanor. Meanwhile, the painting that he hides in his bedroom of himself has become demonic for the painting has taken on all of the hideous characteristics which his lived life is not willing to expose to public view. And this is the wonderful painting by Ivan Albright, which was on display at the uh, Chicago Art Institute for many, many years and is full size. I mean, it's an enormous, it must be 12, 16 feet tall. And to turn around in the gallery and behold, this is truly a frightening event. So this idea that whatever you are pushing is going to turn over, turn around into its opposite. Here we have one of the iconic images of who we are, the, the good, the brave, the defender and founder of liberty. And here is the shadow side, which when pushed again, shows the opposite. Here's a, a wonderful uh, cartoon from the DC comics of Uncle Sam at his most heroic. And here is Uncle Sam, as we might 
see him in 2020 during the, uh, the pandemic isolation. Here is America as Colombia, the generous nurturing female trying to save the refugees of Cuba. And here is how some people see America as the devouring monster eating its children. So the principle of enantiodromia is alive and well and is what is driving this shadow of the American character. Now we come to the psychological import of where this characterization of the American psyche is leading us. In the early 1990s, a British psychoanalyst by the name of Christopher Bolas first used this term violent innocence. And in my mind, it has a lot of similarities to what Gregory Bateson called the double bind which is a situation in which one player holds to their innocence, their stance of unblemished, untarnished innocence with such vehemence that the innocent stance itself becomes violent to the other person in the relationship. It's a, in one sense, you could say it's a form of gaslighting because the innocence is a facade. It's not genuine innocence. It's a feigned innocence, and therefore its attributes are destructive and violent towards those that it encounters. So this denial of the truth of one's being, the insistence upon the face of innocence, gives rise to the effect or the outcome of horrific violence against those who come in contact with it. Now, how is it that we would come to embrace a feigned innocence? And this is where I have the pleasure of introducing you to a very curious coincidence. One might even say a synchronicity that um, on this very date, July 8th of 1741, 280 years ago, the greatest sermon after the sermon preached by um, uh, on the steps of the Capitol um, about the dream, the true American dream, where all of us are created equal. The second most important sermon preached was probably that of Jonathan Edwards, who on July 8th gave the great sermon that we now call Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God which was probably the most perfect um, illustration of the great Calvinistic view of the doctrine of the elect and what the Protestant Reformation was all about in those sort of puritanical veins that came over to the American colonies. This little tidbit from that sermon will help evoke the terror of what was going on in the psyches of the worshiping public. Jonathan Edwards says, the God holds you over the pit of hell, much as one would hold a dangling spider or some loathsome insect. He abhors you, he is dreadfully provoked and his wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the flames, oh sinner. Consider the fearful danger you are in. This kind of hellfire and brimstone was all the rage in sermons of the period. And for those of us living in this secular age, it may be very difficult to fathom what the psychic toll was. Living in a time where you were a true believer, you really believed in an afterlife and could live in a constant perpetual terror of everlasting damnation and hellfire. And what that sets up in the psyche in terms of the need for atonement, for some kind of resolution against this angry father, this angry parent whom you have wronged, who had to send his perfect son to die miserably on the cross for your wretched sins. 
here is a magnificent painting of the uh, last judgment. And you can see the ones who've been cast down into the pits of hell up at the top there where the elect are sitting in neat straight rows with the heavenly choirs behind them. So this is the danger of black and white thinking of these extremes of right and wrong, of good and evil, of the elect or the damned, of having to be on the right side of history. And so we must put forth our innocence. We must see ourselves as innocent or know that we are among the damned. And so we have this stoic sense of being untouchable, of being the golden boy. And here, one of our great golden boys of the American mythos, General George Armstrong Custer, who could do no wrong, who was renowned far and wide, whose name made it around the world as being an exemplar of American courage and bravery. Here is truly hyper-individualism at its best worst. And of course, what it led to was an absolute massacre on both sides and the end to the golden boy at the Battle of Little Bighorn. America sees itself always in these heroic statuesque images, but lurking underneath, and this is how the rest of the world may see us, lurks the villain, the violent one who devours the other nations. So let me try to very carefully parse what I see as this cycle of violent innocence. It's based on the theory of enantiodromia. Here's the yin yang that one thing turns into its opposite. And I believe that we can begin here with the innocence, the feigned innocence, the belief in one's innocence. And innocence is thus always linked to victimhood because there's nothing like the innocent maiden that calls out the dragon or the wicked witch or Bluebeard or someone to victimize you. It's as if the storyline of innocence calls forth victimization. But then when one is victimized, what comes into play in the psyche is this almost universal sense of fair play. We have this instinctive sense of fairness. And we know that innocence should not be victimized. It should not be punished. One who has done nothing should not suffer. And so there arises in the psyche the sense of entitlement. I have been unfairly victimized. If one then brings the sense of entitlement into the public sphere and is supported in the sense of entitlement, one receives power. When there is power, there is the possibility of satisfying that urge towards vengeance and violence. So now the injured party has power over the accused. One becomes the top dog again to mete out retribution against the victimizers. But what happens then is that we feel guilt because we have only so recently been the victim ourselves and suffered that violence and fear that we could be once again in the status of victim. So the, the victim and the victimizer are so close. The guilt and then the fear and then of course the rage that we should be made to feel guilty and fearful because were we not the innocent one to begin with? Hence, we move back into denial. We must regain our innocence in order to relieve the psychic tension of feeling the guilt, the fear, and the rage. And once we've gone back into denial, we are innocent. Now, this cycle that I've just described was one that I arrived at through observing my own emotional turmoil during the emergence and subsequent outcomes of the Me Too movement. Because in the Me Too movement, I could identify with 
women, that great group. And as a woman, as a female, I could feel the female rage. And I could observe my sense of gratification, my sense of entitlement that I ought to have the power to bring down those who had abused me and those like me living in female bodies. And then when the straight white men were being canceled right and left, the sense of guilt around that power and the abuse of that power, not going through the proper channels of justice that the country has set up, but using the powerful platform of public opinion to cancel men sent me into the second half of that a spiral. The guilt, the fear, and the rage, and then back into the denial. I think we could see the same kind of cycle play out this past year when the whole image of the horrific violence that has been addressed to the African Americans in this country was laid bare for all of us to watch so painfully in the case of George Floyd and the others, and the turmoil that came about because of that. The true innocence of so many African Americans ground under the heels and the knees and the guns of white society was obvious. And yet we then had the pushback of the white nationalists, the white skinheads, the white conservatives pushing back on how they too are victims and should not have to bear the brunt of the blame. And so I see this same cycle taking place in this other field. And so because I could see this so closely and so deeply in both of these situations, I'm offering that as a possible validation for what we see in the American character. The key American character I want to introduce is that of Captain America, because I think Captain America represents the iconic American innocent. He comes to birth in 1941, slapping Hitler across the face. He is given birth in this year that we go to war and his co-creators are two Jewish guys from New York. And I'm sure that many of you have read about the creators of comic books and how such a huge disproportionate percentage of the great geniuses of the American comic book happen to be New York Jewish guys. And so we need to work that in as those who understand this role of being the victimized group, of being sent out into a wilderness again and again, and having nothing but your story to hold your character together. So these two Jewish guys, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, give birth to the great Aryan American hero, Captain America. And of course, Captain America is one of these primal heroes. He's a guy with the hammer, the ax. He's one of these early uh, primal heroes. But what's most interesting about him, he does use his hammer from time to time, but his primary tool and weapon is the shield. Captain America kills with his shield. You could translate that to say, Captain America kills through his symbol of innocence. Because if you carry only a shield, you are never the offender, you are only the defender. Captain America is the ultimate defender of the patriotic faith. He is the ultimate innocent patriot. And yet his shield becomes a weapon of mass destruction as those of you who've watched the Avenger movies or seen the comics know very well. So here's the iconic American hero who kills through violent innocence.
But in March of 2007, he was killed off. This great American hero was killed. Why? Because he couldn't evolve. They'd taken his storyline as far as they could. They couldn't see a way out of his hyper patriotism. It did not allow him any subtlety. There was no nuance possible for him. And so he's killed off. And those of you who've watched the movies know that this is also true in the latest Avengers trilogy. So we have now our iconic character who is the epitome of someone who kills. Now my last uh, section here comes back to the idea of the mythopoetic method. What can we learn if we have arrived at the dead end of this mythic character, the archetype of the innocent hero who kills through violent innocence? Where do we go if we can't take his storyline any further? Are there other myths that could guide us into the next stage or phase of our story? America has been likened to a Hercules character. Here is a very early cartoon of baby America as Hercules seizing the two serpents. And as we know, Hercules has this episode of madness where he kills his own wife and children. And certainly our heroic character is eating, devouring its own. We have reached that stage, that madness and mayhem. Alas, we have no divine Athena to give us a break to find a way to redeem us. That is not an option. But I believe we do have a redemptive myth that belongs to this land, which we have known about for 300 years. And if we could only take it and learn from it, we might in fact be able to move ourselves into the next stage of our identity. This is a map of the peoples of the Longhouse. These are the nations of the Iroquois Confederacy. You can see that the general shape is that of New York State, which is the central area where many of the tribes lived. The Iroquois Confederacy is a fascinating group because they were well, well known to the founding fathers. Um, one of the Native American interpreters, Conrad Weiser, was a very good friend of Benjamin Franklin and sent Franklin the transcript of his meetings with the Iroquois chiefs as they were working out some of their peace treaties. Benjamin Franklin set the type for the publication of this uh, anthropological research. And Ben Franklin invited the chiefs of the Six Nations to meet with other members of the Continental Congress. And they actually did meet on June 11th, 1776, less than one month before the Declaration of Independence was signed. Four fathers sat down with these chiefs and had conversation with them. And this is all recorded in the records of the Continental Congress. So it is from these wise people that we draw this legend, this myth that I would like to recount to you. It's the great story of the peacemaker, Deganawida. Now there are many, many versions of this tale and I am going to tell you what's, what feels alive and right to share in this moment. And that comes from the admonitions of a Mohawk grandmother who reminded us that when we tell stories, the ancestors are listening and they get bored if we tell the story the same way every time. So a good storyteller must stay alert to the, the murmurings and urgings of the spirit of the moment in order that the ancestors too will be entertained and invigorated by the telling of the story. So it is in that spirit that I share with you this beautiful story from the Onondaga peoples, Deganawida, 
and Hiawatha. I'm going to come into the very middle of the myth because this is a very long saga and we don't have a lot of time. Here is Deganawida searching for Hiawatha. For Hiawatha had fallen into a state of deep grief. The evil one, the tangled one, had through dark magic killed his wife and daughters. And in his grief, Hiawatha had turned himself into a tangled one, had turned dark and loathsome, had locked himself away, and had become a cannibal like so many other of his kind. He was at this very moment that Deganawida found him in his longhouse, preparing to boil his cauldron and eat his supper of human flesh. And it was at this moment that he bent over the cauldron of his water that Deganawida, climbing on to the roof of his hogan, looked down into the fire. And there his face shone on the water in the pot. And Hiawatha, peering into the water, saw reflected back to him a face of exquisite beauty. But whose face could this be, he thought, but my own? Am I not looking at the reflection of my own face in the water? Surely such a beautiful face must belong to one who has goodness in him. And if that is so, what am I doing? eating one of my own kind. And Hiawatha rushed from that place and Deganawida following him, brought him down to the lake of the song. And there the two of them grieved together. And Hiawatha would have thrown himself into the lake and drowned, but the birds gathered and lifting their wings, they pulled all of the water off the lake and tossed it into the air. And there, at the bottom of the lake shining, were the great round shells of wampum. And these Deganawida took, and he taught Hiawatha how to weave the shells and make the belt of wampum, to tell the story of the grief rituals and Deganawida gave Hiawatha the belt of grief, and he gave him the words of condolence that would bind up his heart. And Hiawatha made a belt of the words of condolence to remember forever what they were. And when his heart had been mended, and when he no longer desired vengeance, Deganawida and Hiawatha went together to seek the Tangled One, Atoharo, the tangled one whose binding was of snakes, the snakes who sought to tear his mind asunder, who kept his enemies at bay, who slathered poison into the ears of those who would teach him the ways of goodness. To him did Deganawida and Hiawatha go. I will tell you that Atoharo is a terrible, and dreadful one. So tangled was his mind that when he saw these two chiefs coming towards him, he turned his terrible dark magic upon them. And only by calling the animals of the forest to their aid could they get close enough to this evil one to cast him down and begin the ritual of healing. And Deganawida led. He grabbed the hand of the evil one and held his heart to keep it from breaking while Hiawatha combed the evil one's hair, combed the evil thoughts, combed out the tangles until at last Atotarho became who he was, became the greatest chief of the Iroquois League became the one to whom the others would listen. And when the others heard that the evil one himself had been transformed, they agreed to come and listen to Deganawida, to peacemaker, 
to hear what it was, his vision of peace amongst them, of the laying down of the weapons. And so, after so much violence, it came about that the nations fell together to bring their wise ones, the ones chosen by the grandmothers to listen to the words of wisdom and bring them to the council of peace. And those who came buried their hatchet under the great tree of peace, buried the weapons of war deep amongst the roots and learned to live with one another. And so if we are to bury the hatchet, if we are to pick up the comb and the mirror and make those our mythic tools, if we are to no longer carry and wield the hatchet or the false shield of innocence, we must use the mirror. We must wake up from the dream into a new vision of a greater maturity, a greater ability to bear and tolerate the emotions that would cause us to move towards too quick, too easy an answer, which is always the wrong answer, as Elie Wiesel so wisely said. And so that takes me to the end of my PowerPoint. And I hope that this has given you something to chew on, some good images to put into your heart and ponder. And I would love now to turn the microphone over to Epek Burnett and see what wonderful uh, ideas she might have to amplify or redirect us on this quest. Um, Rebecca, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this Smith Salon. And what a rich presentation. What a rich presentation. I, as I'm soaking in all these imagery, I'm reminded of something James Hillman said, it takes a lifetime to unpack an image. And here we are, you offered us so many images. It's gonna take us beyond our lifetimes, of course, generations and generations of unpacking is necessary. It's really necessary and it's gonna be a difficult task, but that's what it's gonna to come to perhaps. So where do I start um, innocence since you asked me to talk about innocence and then this idea of waking up, I'm gonna go back to James Hillman. Uh, James Hillman, one of his uh, quotes that I'm gonna to try to paraphrase, he says, innocence, innocence, and we love it. We want to stay pristine, untouched, unwounded. Even as the country crumbles, we say the best of America is ahead of us. Because if we were to wake up, if we were to wake up from this innocence, we will see dead bodies, murdered bodies from now to the, um, until the since the colonists, I mean, the buffalo, bison, forests, native slaves. So we stay innocent. Innocent is the American form of historical repression, is what Helen says. And I find that so powerful. Innocence as the American form of historical repression. Innocence as a repression, innocence as an escape escape from responsibility as a shield. Rebecca, you beautifully brought that shield image, right? A shield from guilt, sin, um, shame, and, and self-awareness, self-knowledge. Really, and Hillman also talks about innocence in that light, saying that innocence is, um, in America, innocence is all about not knowing and not wanting to know either. Another James, another, my favorite James, James Baldwin, American novelist, civil rights activist, he talks about American innocence as the crime itself. Innocence is the crime itself. So there is something you call, you um, in your speech was talking, you, you were talking about the violent innocence. I do agree with you so much. There is something violent in the innocence itself. This whole disowning, repressing, 
and unknowing. So in Jungian psychology, as we know, to seeking what lies beyond the ego consciousness, we have to look at the darkness within our own psyches and also the dark side of the whole ancestral heritage, shadow and the collective shadow, right? And Eric Newman talks about it and says, in this confrontation, one must sacrifice innocence an unambiguous certitude about the positive values and virtues one has always identified with. And in this journey and the psychology, self-knowledge, again, in Eric Newman's words, one gets poorer in illusions, but richer in insight and understanding. Poorer in illusions, richer in insight and understanding. To me, that is so much about wisdom and humility. And I really think that is the task at hand here, humility in some ways, humility and the, your ending image, so powerful. Go look in the mirror, see yourself, not just America, not seeing itself only with the successes and um, strengths and pride and power, but also the losses also the limitations and failures and fears and yearnings, all that, everything belongs. So going from, I guess here is the part that gets really complicated. And here I would like to invite everyone else to chime in. Humility, on one hand, we have this, the need for humility, wisdom and humility. And on the other hand, we have this hubris, right? The images that Rebecca shared, so much of it, also the exceptionalism, hyper-individualism, this superpower, um, world empire, um, the hero with the ax, Hercules, all of that to me has that sense of hubris. How do we go from hubris and the resistance or self-reflection because when we try to, sometimes these attempts at critical thinking in America is either labeled, accused as being an American. How do we take that off, stigma away? How can we have these dialogues? How can we go from hubris to resistance to humility? I don't have the answer, I think. So I would love everyone to chime in and um, take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Epek, and, and thank you, Rebecca. Um, you know, I, I think, actually, I think about this question a lot, especially in a classroom, um, when you see the kind of tides of criticism uh, kind of ebb and flow and how people react to, to that. And I think, you know, we ask our question, um, do we get better by acknowledging our shadow or do we get better by reclaiming the best of ourselves? And I think that um, what's so important in a conversation like this is that we're, we have we're discussing both because if we're not discussing both at the same time, it feels like an attack. Um, and it feels like, what's the point, you know, what's the point of just deconstructing, which is, you know, so I think that what we've gone through in this last year and what we continue to go through is not just a coming to awareness of our own shadow and not just to focus on what makes us great, but a recognition that we're not great, so long as we're not acknowledging our shadow. And that the only way to be the best we can be <clears throat> is by becoming aware uh, and getting past our own delusion. And so, you know, I, I really appreciate the question. And I, and I really think that, um, you know, this is, this is one of those times where on one hand, we absolutely have to deconstruct the shadow. Um, and on the other, we're lost if we don't really cling to and reclaim what's our best. And, you know, Rebecca, you were in Chicago. And of course, Eliada was in Chicago. And Eliada has this concept of the eternal return, that we retell our creation myth every time we have a renewal story. And I think that that cherry blossom, uh, sorry, the cherry tree is a good example of that. And, and I think that, um, you know, on the way through to a new year, First, he says, is chasing out all the demons and getting rid of all the bad stuff and purging. And, uh, you know, that's the question that I'll leave, you know, uh, I'll leave on the table uh, for you, Rebecca. Do you think that we might be in a process, in a phase in this cycle 
of purging that might not necessarily be the end of the journey. Like may there be a, a phase that, that brings us to a reclamation of maybe what we do care to be after we deconstruct, what we're not so happy about ourselves uh, engaging. Well, I think what was most important to me in looking at the, how do we go forward? was that recognition when I was trying to feel, literally feel my way through the innocence violence cycle, was I recognized that identifying with the mass, with the group, all women, I am woman, therefore I will think like a woman, I'm part of the me too. I could feel the archetypal rage which made me feel entitled, which empowered me to seek redress, which kindled that bloodlust for vengeance against those who'd harmed us. It was only by breaking into that sort of collective mentality and coming back to, but what's my personal story? How would I actually address the real individuals who may have crossed the line with me. Do I actually want to hurt them? It was only by coming back to a sense of individual to individual that I saw a way to break the cycle of violence, innocence, violence, innocence, and instead move towards something like reconciliation, the truth and reconciliation. You can't do it at the collective level. And that's why it felt so important to be able to address this through Jung's wisdom, through the mythic, the mythopoetic vision, because it always brings you back. It brings you back to the individual work. That's what Jung and Campbell and Hillman, that's what they all say. I'm curious, actually, on that note, if Selena, you know, if you have any reactions uh, in your experience and clinical experience to this kind of process of innocence or if there's anything you'd like to add. Yeah, Rebecca, I, I, I think that clinically, you know, people come in, they're, they're innocent in, in a certain way. They have their certain forms of the way that they think. And I think the only way for growth to occur is, is uh, to sacrifice their perceptions. And it doesn't matter if they're 11 or if they're 70. You have to sacrifice something in order to move. And when in the process of actually doing the work, people are shocked to their core because all day I talk about the unconscious gears that move them. And it's like in a clock, the clock is always going in a certain way, but they can't see it, they can't hear it, they can't experience it, but the gears are moving. And my work I see clinically is to help them to connect those pieces so that they can get the wisdom and shift their perception for the ability to see a different future for themselves or to experience that. So that, that's sort of how I, I see it. Well, and to your point that it requires this sacrifice of one's protected perceptions of the self and its goodness and innocence. And the sacrifice has to be witnessed and mutually grieved. That's what's so beautiful about the, the truth and reconciliation process is that it involves witnessing the grief and the importance in the Deganawita peacemaker story that when Hiawatha is first awakened to himself, he still has vengeance in his heart. And it requires this incredible multi-day and night ritual at the lake of sorrow, going through the, the, the condolence ceremony in order to clear him enough that he can pick up the new vision. And I think that's what's missing. We do not know how to grieve. And until we can grieve as individuals and as a nation, we can't get out of the cycle because we don't have the power, the psychological uh, energy to move past that really dangerous place where we've sacrificed 
the perception of self. And I think it's because we have still too much of the momentum of that old time religion saying, if you're not innocent, you're damned. In other words, there's no safety in sacrificing those perceptions. So it really requires a lot of detangling, a lot of combing out of the old timey religious beliefs that are still stuck into the psychic thought process, or into our hair. We're, we're still Medusa. <laughs> Very scary for people to do that. Uh, people are frightened when you take them to those levels. And that's something I just wanted just to put out there. It's not easy for anyone. As we talk about innocence and, and come back to the cherry tree, I'm just wondering, Zaman, if we're going to talk about Eden. Yes, well, we could talk about Eden. I had a lot of things to talk about, but then there was this whole, um, a whole lot of synchronicity that was just uh, flying into my space here. Uh, this Sunday, I will be presenting um, on uh, Mirror in the poetry of the great Indian uh, poet, Bedil, uh, which means the one without the heart. That's his pen name. Uh, but the, it is going to be, uh, and he uses the word mirror a whole lot in his poetry, but I'll be presenting in a conference that's held in Montreal, right on the other side of the Iroquois <laughs> territory, basically. Um, and, and the idea is that the, uh, this is a poet who probably uses the word mirror and awe more than anyone else. Um, and, and the word mirror uh, in Persian comes from, um, it's pronounced a-i-na. A is both a, but it also is the word for inviting in the divine. Because then the next word close to a-i-na is a-in, and a-in means faith, religion. In other words, you cannot see God unless you see it in the mirror reflected. It's the other side of you. But what makes that vision possible? It makes it possible like in a real mirror only if you take your darkness, your shadow side, and put it beyond on the other side. Because if there is no... Um, if you don't put the shadow side there is there, there is no mirror it's just a glass it is not going to reflect the only way it can reflect is if you put all the the darkness on the other side then you look into the mirror and then you say the word awe which coincidentally in english is like the word awe which is the, the second word that bedel uses in his poetry but it is the first word of uh, inviting the divine in. So when you are seeing uh, the image, your own image in, in the mirror, it is the divine that you see. It's the divine within that is reflected. And uh, in it, uh, when we are talking about uh, violence and innocence and all that, uh, the violence part of it is that you cannot see that unless, uh, if the mirror reflects all the negativity in you, you have no choice but to break the mirror. Okay, which is when the ego is within you, but then it still it tells you now, you have to break the ego within you and leave the mirror as is to um, to show all the the miseries and the nasty things with you. So if you do that, then the mirror stays where it's supposed to. You stay where you're supposed to. All you have to do is make sure you have gotten rid of the ego and put it on the other side, on the, on the yonder side of the, of the glass, which will turn it into a mirror, in which case you can then see yourself um, not much different from the divine within. And it's all one. And so I just want to, uh, uh, like, like I've been kind of captivated by the uh, different things that happened uh, so much in, in the synchronistic realm that I, I thought that it was probably more like a, 
a follow up to uh, the the beautiful um, uh, talk that Rebecca gave that I really enjoyed and uh, I'm I'm just uh, utterly elated. Thank you. It's so wonderful, Zaman, that you bring in the idea of the necessity of the divine and the transcendence. Because Degan Awida is considered a divine personage. He's not an ordinary mortal. He's, you know, in Christian terminology, he's the Christ figure. So when Degan Awida looks into the cauldron, it's the face of the divine that Hiawatha sees when he looks in and mistakes it for his own face. So in that image, it's exactly as in the poetic image that you described. There's darkness in the bottom of that cauldron. But it's what's only the word for cauldron in Persian? What? Big. <laughs> I mean, it keeps going on. Like <laughs> it's wonder. The synchronicities are wonderful. Yeah. But I think that in these secular times, we forget that we need something that is transcendent of the human ego to get ourselves out of these situations sometimes, or we just fall back into hubris and arrogance. When we look in and, we, and we're seeing the reflection as the divine, it's not the ego that's God, huh? It's the divine self that we should be looking at in the mirror every now and then. And, and it's when we innocently look in the mirror, we're like, oh, look at that God, I'm pretty innocent. Uh, you know, uh, thank you, Zaman, for pointing us towards the importance of, of when we do because this. The word, the word for, uh, for uh, the mirror is derived from the word for faith or religion, ayin and ayina. One is the derivative of the other. So um, uh, just to think about this word being coined, uh, I don't know, 3,000 years ago or sometime, and they probably, the mirrors they probably had were polished uh, steel metal or something, or perhaps reflections in, in, in the pool. I don't know if they had uh, discovered uh, glass and mirror at that time, but, uh, but the word has been coined. You know, I, uh, since we're talking about um, the importance of the darkness below uh, and recognizing that, this is a theme that Boris comes back to, you know, regularly uh, engaging the unengaged darkness. And um, and I wonder, Boris, if if any of this conversation has has brought any of that up for you. Um, it certainly has. Uh, matter of fact, I think I need a few more minutes to just kind of work through it, but to, answer, to give you a kind of quick response. Right, it's more, and I think both uh, Miss Burnett, um, and I love your book, uh, A Young and Inquiry into the American Psyche. I think it's fundamental to understanding any notion of American violence, American innocence. I think it's fundamental. Um, and I guess well, I'll come back later, but to me, um, And it's not merely that we have to um, uh, address the darkness within. That is individualism. Individuation is addressing the darkness within and transforming it into part of who you are. It is not getting rid of it. It is not putting it to the side. And so our inability to discuss these issues, right, um, is reflected in the limitations of, of, of um, the project of the individual versus individuation. And Toni Morrison, I'll end with this, Toni Morrison put it best, that it is the unreasonable, it is the reasonable man, or the unreasonable man and woman who don't adjust, or who are able to adjust. And so she wants to be unreasonable, not reasonable. And she ends by saying she doesn't want to be in the prison of I or the individual. She wants to be in the, in the she wants to be in the open space of the we which shatters any notion of us being individuals. So I'll just stop there for now and thanks for calling on me.
Yeah, I think uh, uh, of Dennis's line that we actually have a nice clip of uh, hell is the prison of this. It was the, of the self. Hell is the prison of, of being locked inside the self. Um, wondering, Dennis, if you have any thoughts for us. Yes, and I'll and I'll watch the clock uh, here because I have a I have some shards, uh, Rebecca, for you. But I want to acknowledge first, you are a magnificent storyteller. I mean, I just kind of got lost in your voice. The images were wonderful, but I didn't need them <laughs> because your voice um, has that dramatic vitality that is um, a real gift. So I wanted to acknowledge you for that. You know, I remember when 9-11 happened, one of the strains of response was, what the hell is this? What have we done to anybody? I mean, it was the, it was the chorus cry of innocence. Uh, so that's one thing I wanted to mention. Another, the, the mentor that I had as a grad student and was a marvelous woman who taught us the four genres of literature, ly lyric, tragedy, comedy, and epic. And each one of those uh, terrains, I think they're, they're, they're terrains of the psyche, each has three moments in them. And I don't want to go into that, but listening to you, it really, um, I think the genre that most attacks innocence is tragedy. Um, in comedy, one steps across boundaries, but in tragedy, boundaries are shattered. And one of the biggest boundaries that shattered in tragedy is the, sh is the boundary of the ego. So that, you know, most, tra most tragedies end with something being redeemed. People say, well, it's tragic, you know, it's a tragic loss, which really does disservice to the word uh, tragedy because a raising of consciousness is most often what happens to the tragic hero who must suffer out of him or herself uh, into a wider program, into a wider worldview. So tragedy, as, as, the, as the movement of the soul to lose its innocence is, uh, is worth at least noting. The other uh, thing that I wanna mention is uh, Kurt Anderson's book, He's come out with a uh, uh, second one, but I read it and I reviewed it, and it's called Fantasy Land. Um, How America Went Haywire, a 500-year history. And it's a wonderful study from Luther forward on how America clings to innocence as a justification for all kinds of atrocities. And you brought uh, that up in IPIC as well and, and some of you other. And then the last thing I wanna say is you're really uh, inviting, I feel an invitation to return to Herman Melville's Billy Budd. It's the last thing that Melville wrote. He died in 1891, I think it was just very close to that to his death that he wrote Billy Budd. And the best reading that I have come across is in Rollo May's wonderful study, Power and Innocence. And his reading of um, Billy Budd, the poor, the golden boy, everyone loves him, but not Claggart on board the ship who Billy's innocence angers him. And Billy Budd, if you remember, uh, is perfect, but he stutters when he becomes upset or excited. 
And that impediment of speech um, is pushed to the breaking point when he uh, is being um, abused verbally by Claggart. And his stutter goes down into his body and up into his right arm, and he punches Claggart, who is dead before he lands on the deck. And Captain Veer, in the code, has to execute Billy Budd on board. But I think Melville is, um, the reason I want to go back to it, and then I'll, I'll stop, is that your talk has made me think Melville was on to this American uh, trait of innocence and how it has an has flaws. And one of them is the inability to speak when one becomes uh, excited. So, so th thank you. So those are just a few things that I wanted to put out, but uh, tomorrow I'm going back to Billy Budd. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dennis, in a wild synchronicity, Deganawida has to seek out Hiawatha because Deganawida has a speech impediment. Oh my gosh. He said, they will not be able to understand me. I must find a spokesperson oh. for my vision. So I don't know where we're gonna go with that, but I just no, thought I looked up the synchronicity. Wonderful. But another voice and another way of looking at tragedy, which I think is so valuable, is uh, a theme that Cornell West comes to again and again. And I just mm. love Cornell West. He's another what I call the sacred clown of American philosophy. Yeah. He said, why is it that America is so obsessed with romanticism? He said, romanticism always ends in disappointment. You're just so disappointed that things don't turn out happy at the end. He said, you've got to look to the birth of the blues. He said, the mm. blues is the antidote to unhealthy romanticism. Mm. Because the blues begins in disappointment and just goes down into the shattered <laughs> reality of life. Yeah, beautiful. It, I mean, listening to him rant on that, it's like, wow, that's <laughs> the ticket. You have to deal with romanticism, which is another form of innocence, yep. which says, I deserve yes. a happy ending. Yes. And instead adopt the attitude of the blues which is no, we're all born into brokenness. Yes. And, and that's okay. Yes. We don't fight our darkness. We go, this is simply part of yes. what is true about me. Yes. We lose the, the horrible either or black, white. Yeah. Yeah. Rebecca, you're wonderful. Thank Dennis, you. Dennis, thank you. <laughs> You know, since you brought up Cornell West, I wondered if I would bring this up tonight since we're talking about individuality. Uh, I had the good fortune of seeing him at the American Academy of Religions conference in um, Baltimore. And I saw him and there was a conversation about music and how music participates in, in helping us come together and create union. And uh, I'm a big dork and I am really interested in, in wave dynamics and how waves give us a metaphorical uh, structure for union, you know, waves can be one in many, whatever. So I lay out my, my thing, I raise my hand back in the room, big dork, uh, stammering to, to hear, you know, say something that I know Cornell West is listening to. And, um, and he says, what he says is he says, um, as important as union is, the individual can never be lost. We, it can never be at the expense of the individual. And that was just so important and so moving. And, um, and I'm glad for the opportunity to bring it up tonight and, and even more glad for uh, the um, convenient transition to Clyde, whose book, uh, Hero with an African Face, um, has uh, Cornell West's um, promotion of the book on, on the cover. <laughs> uh, Clyde, wondering if you have any thoughts on the evening. I was going to say that one of the interesting things for me is that I felt like I was listening to a presentation about people that were not me. And I really said, well, this is very interesting. I'm listening to a, a really great description of folks that I don't identify with. And I found that throughout the uh, presentation. 
And so, for example, when you, Rebecca, and I thought it was wonderful, showed that image of George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, my attention was immediately drawn to the figures in the background of that picture, which were a slave man and a slave woman tending to a cherry tree. And I thought to myself, isn't this a very interesting juxtaposition? Because here you have the axis mundi, if you will, that Washington is chopping down. And on the other part of that picture, you have the axis mundi, which the shadow within America in terms of race is supporting and lifting up. And it brought to mind a number of things. In particular, it brought to mind some of what uh, Martin had to say about the importance of the African-American experience really being that which pushes America to be what it mythically thinks it is. And I thought it was really, that picture was very powerful for me in that respect. So I don't wanna to spend too much time other than to say, um, I think this is a very important discussion to have. And yet there are elements of this discussion in which I don't see myself in. And I think many African-Americans would not see themselves in because it is not in many ways talking about us. And that's okay. That is not to say this is an important discussion to have. It is, the major well, the current majority white culture to talk about these issues because this is also the way that one breaks open this focus on the individual, which has caused the violence of the innocent so I, or the person who tends to be innocent. I do think there is another, there are many parts of this story and obviously there's no way that one presentation can lay bare all these parts, but I thought it might be interesting for you, Rebecca, at least to hear from my vantage point that I found this a fascinating discussion where I did, whenever you said American, Rebecca, my mind said white American. And because I just, as a person of color, didn't identify with that myth because it is not the myth that I've lived. And I think it's important also, i just say this very briefly, for me, that quote from Jung, which I've often used, I'm you know, a psychotherapist as well too, or that's my training. I always added to it that not only was it important for me to know the myth I was waking into, we'll say, but I also needed to know where I was in the mythic cycle of that myth. And I think it is really important for America, if you will, to understand where they are in the myth that they may be, as some people may be waking up into. So I'll stop there and um, thank you very much. Well, I thank you so much. That is so perfect that you picked up the rest of that image the because the image is speaking everything right the foreground yeah. is the white european colonial mythic story going on in the background is the whole rest of the saga i mean Absolutely. you're so right if i if i ever do this again i'll say this is the story of the white american myth because it is and my approach to it is that it's all tangled up in the white Christian European myth, which mistook the word innocent to mean ignorance, which in fact is a bad translation of the Greek. The real word innocent means to do no harm. Right. But the way we get it through the Garden of Eden story means, oops, we got knowledge and now we're damned. Right. right? In a nutshell, that's the myth that the mythic message we get out of the Garden of Eden story. So I see this all as a horrible, you know, crippling undoing that comes down from the Christian or origination myth. And then the American version of it, which is the George Washington seeking atonement with his father after he's cut down Axis Mundi, right? right. I mean, I, I said 
there was no consequence for cutting down the tree, which we now see how, hor how horrific it was that there should be no consequence for cutting the tree. Because in a true story, that needed to be addressed first. Right. That was a sin against nature. And then if you want to address everything else that was going on in that story. So in a sense, that's a good painting because in microcosm, it's the whole American story and what went wrong. Oh, no, I think it's a great, white people it's a great be foregrounded yes. and the black people be backgrounded yes. and made smaller. Right. Yes. I mean, the whole thing. It's just thank you so much for bringing that up because it's really true. And I think what you pointed at and what Varus has pointed at is also really important that the focus on individualism, which tends towards hyper individualism, is part of the white European sin. That's the trajectory of the Enlightenment, but that's not the trajectory of the story of the African Americans for whom the group and the usness has always been so potent and so powerful. So there again, it, it's a, a, the white sin that we're talking about and that I was addressing tonight. And thank you for just clarifying that so that we can all see it. <laughs> really, it was beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Yes. You know, Rebecca, the thing that struck me both in what Clyde said and your presentation was the way in which unity is not so much derived from diversity, that is keeping diversity alive, but it has to do away with doing away with diversity. And that diversity itself is the soul of whatever the collective enterprise is and wants to be, whether it's people of color, whether it's male or female, whether it's people of ability, whatever it happens to be. It's the idea that we honor and keep these individual natures themselves. We, each individual nature has an authenticity in it. I saw the problem with that picture both the people in the back, but the authority figure in the front who is not out in the yard, who is inside the house, who is larger than everything and who is governing the, over, uh, the overseeing of everything. And I think our, our big shadow in America is the way in which we worship authority and affluence. We associate that and project that upon white people and people who have affluence. But the real issue is that we do not have much tolerance for diversity or difference. And until we come up with a way to honor diversity and honor difference, we're going to be stuck in a, in a kind of an endless cycle of trying to find a scapegoat for our shadow. Beautifully said, beautifully summarized. And the, um, you know, the problem there of the acceptance of the diversity is also hardwired into the notions of equality, again, that de Tocqueville talked about, that any difference is, is perceived as threatening when we're not awake and aware of what it is that we're asking for. We would rather cut off things that are different in our effort to make sure that exact equality is maintained. Otherwise we feel threatened and you can certainly see that going on right now in American politics, the, that terrible feeling that I'm threatened, my right to be as equal as I want to be is being terribly threatened. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, if I can throw in a, uh, we did talk about the synchronicity. What about a parallel? Uh, you say that uh, they're going to be there was a stutter, a stutterer. Who else was a stutterer in history? Moses. So you have the same pair between uh, Hiawatha and Deganovida, and then you have uh, Moses and um, Aaron. And Moses is stutter, a stutterer, so he has to take Aaron with him. To whom? To Pharaoh. The word uh, for Pharaoh in Arabic is Pharaon, which is derived from hubris and arrogance. And he had the arrogance 
of not being able to look into what? Into the water that was Moses, Moses from water. And uh, the, instead of uh, looking into the mirror, uh, he threw what against him? The snakes and the serpents, which is what we saw in your uh, uh, slides there. So had he been able to swallow his uh, pride and arrogance and look into the mirror or into the water to be reflected instead of throwing the serpents, things might have been different. But um, if they would have been too different, we probably wouldn't have had such an interesting story to remember. <laughs> Beautiful observation. Amazing. It might also be useful as we were getting close to the end of our hour to come back because what feels alive to me right now, like the next step in this conversation is to look at individuation and togetherness, that there, there's something in the tension there that the Euro white European focus on being an individual, being myself, I wanna be me, versus the need to sacrifice the ego in order to redeem the whole picture, not just focus on the one character that's foregrounded, but how do you embrace everyone in that picture? And I don't know, maybe Cornell West had it right. Maybe we need to start with the blues and jazz and think about that in terms of the magnificent music that is made when a lot of people are improvising together and calling the song up together rather than always being a soloist. And there's maybe a lot that we can learn from that attitude. And again, it takes us out of our head too, to get into the music, back into the body and learn how to be joyful again in community with one another. That, that may be part of our next step. You know, and this is where the, the Jungian connection to the conversation around the individual becomes especially unique, where uh, the individual is, is both to be deconstructed and to be built upon. You know, the individuation journey is, it follows us through both. And I thought, you know, uh, since I just want to thank uh, EPEC for joining us tonight, um, I thought I'd ask if you had any final thoughts with us before we go to Dana and, and wrap up. Um, well, I just want to comment on what Rebecca said, blues, and I just, I personally love listening to blues and the alchemical significance of the color blue. You know, Hillman writes quite a bit about that. In alchemy, um, in albedo, it has a tint of blue and the blues of sorrows and bruises and those memories come in there. And he says blue protects white from innocence. Yes. So I just wanted to share that. Um, I love that we can end on that note of blues. Ah, well, to really end on a note of blues, I'll croon just one line of the song that was sung at my parents' wedding by Big Bill Brunzi, who is a good friend of my folks. They were co-founders of the Old Town School of Folk Music in Chicago, home of the blues. And at their wedding, Bill, Big, Bru Big Bill Brunzi saying, you gotta live a little, give a little, let your poor heart break a little. That's the story of, that's the glory of love. <laughs> so maybe there's a good place to end, love. Oh, that's beautiful. Wow, beautiful. What a nice afternoon and When I find myself dealing with diversity, I'm just struck by nature. I'm struck by we're all one of a kind. There's no two of any of us. The idea of collectivizing any of us is, is a, a, an inflated myth of self-importance. We seem to need an agreement we like the idea of company, we're relational beings, but in reality, all we have is the Tao. All we have is endless, infinite ability and possibility. So let's go out with a moment of silence 
each of us carry us forth into our own individual lives that really have nothing to do with any of the others. We all make this up. It's just an endless search for meaning and value and virtue. And I deeply appreciate everybody that has come into the myth salon month after month, week after week. I wanna thank my good friend and colleague, Will Lynn, without whom I would never have been, I, would, I just wouldn't have done this. And Selena and Zaman and Voris and Dennis and Epec, who, who did I forget? Somebody, I'm sure I forgot somebody. And AJ, I don't want to forget AJ. AJ is behind the scenes. He makes this thing happen magically. So let's give a, just a little moment of silence here. Let's see, move this thing in there. All right. Thank you, everyone. Peace, be well. Thank you very much, everybody. Clyde, thank you for coming in with us today. Oh, thank you, Dana. <laughs> what a joy. Yeah, thank, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Rebecca. Dana, thank you. Clyde, Dennis, Zaman, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Uh,